Hi, I'm Joel Papadix and welcome to my studio. I taught a very popular plein air workshop in Camden, Maine for many years. Camden is a sleepy harbor town located in mid-coast Maine that's noted for its schooners, music, and culture. A popular painting spot for many of my students was this view of Curtis Island Lighthouse. It's a little difficult to find, but well worth the effort. It provided cool shade on hot summer days and a spectacular view of Penobscot Bay. Plus, all day long, schooners, catches, catboats, and sloops drifted in and out of our compositions. In this video, we're going to paint everything negatively. Don't worry, that's a positive thing. We'll paint the lighthouse, a cumulus sky, and sailboats by painting the space around them. Before you try this video, go to my website at watercolorpop.com and on the Paint Along With Pop page, download my notes and reference. You'll find the links in the description box below. I suggest you watch it all the way through and then rewatch it as you paint, pausing as needed. I always like to start with a little inspiration from artists whom I admire. Morning Moon Pintails by the American watercolor master Frank W. Benson is an excellent example of negative painting. In his picture, he paints the exterior shapes of the ducks, clouds, and moon by carefully painting the sky around each. In Andrew Wyeth's watercolor, The Lobsterman, he generates the white rowboat and buoy by painting the dark blue ocean that surrounds it. Negative painting is a concept we often take for granted, but once we're aware of how it works, it can make a huge difference in how we watercolor. With these images in mind, let's begin. I start by completely wetting the paper. This gets my whole arm moving and helps me to paint in a loose manner. It also cleans the surface of any eraser, crumbs, dirt, or oil that I may have transferred from my hand to the paper while working on the drawing. I want a little color in the clouds, lighthouse, and schooner, but I don't want to add too much as it's the middle of the afternoon. We tend to see more color in the landscape at sunrise and sunset. I drop a little extra cadmium orange and red into the schooner and lighthouse and roll the paper around to blend it evenly. I mix a fair amount of cobalt blue and Windsor blue green shade for the sky. The shine on the paper is just starting to disappear and we're at the moist stage of wetness. You know, if you think about it, the white clouds have already been painted and now we're going to paint the space around them, which is the blue sky. This is called negative painting. As you do this, don't think about the white clouds anymore. Just try to see the blue shapes and focus on that as you paint. It's hard to work negatively. We've been conditioned to think in a positive way our entire lives. In fact, they even write books about it, The Power of Positive Thinking. If I ever write a watercolor painting book, I think I'll call it The Power of Negative Thinking. I make the cloud shapes larger at the top of the composition, thinner and space closer together as they recede into the distance. I also make the blue parts of the sky lighter as it progresses towards the horizon. Mix a little cadmium red with some cobalt blue for the shadows on the bases of the clouds. Notice that my paper is still at the moist stage of wetness. This is important. If you paint it too slowly and your paper has dried, you'll get hard edges or blooms all over the place. If this has happened to you, stop and completely dry the paper then re-wet it and wait until the moist stage happens again. Notice that I always dip my brush into a paper towel every time I reload. I do this because I don't want to add more water to the paper, only paint. Completely dry the paper for the next step. The left sides of the white buildings more directly face the sun. You'll notice that the right sides are slightly darker and cooler, even though they're in the light. This happens because every time there's a shift in plane, there's a shift in value. Use a very, very light wash of cobalt blue to suggest these slightly darker planes. I pre-mix my landscape greens, which is a topic for another video. Using cadmium lemon yellow, not lemon yellow, and French ultramarine blue, mix a 50-50 ratio of blue and yellow for the darker evergreen trees. 
I make the deciduous trees to the right of the evergreens a little lighter in value by adding more cadmium lemon and water. I scrape the brush on the side for a more natural looking texture. The grass is lighter in value and I add even more water in yellow for this flat plane. I avoid making a straight line where the lighthouse meets the grass. I make it look like there's a bush or some things in front of it. The rocky ledge below the grass has multiple colors. Mix a reddish brown using cadmium orange and cadmium scarlet with a little bit of ivory black. Fuse the wet grass color with this mixture for some lost edges. Vary the color with a little bit of cobalt blue for the cooler sky planes. Not only does this look good, but it's fun to fuse the wet colors together. The rocks that are subjected to the tide are very dark, black in fact. So blend some ivory black into the lighter brown color before it dries. Create a shapely rock formation on the far right by scraping the side of a flat brush across the top fibers of your paper. Paint the bottom of the rocks where it meets the water fairly level. It's straighter than you think. Hit a few extra darks here and there in the ledge before it completely dries. Next, we're going to paint the distant land masses. Add a lot of cobalt blue into your leftover green. Although the land back there is full of green trees, it's remarkable how blue they are in appearance. This is due to atmospheric perspective. Things get lighter and bluer as they recede. Carefully paint around the buildings and make as straight a line as you can where the horizon meets the water. Skip a triangular shape for a distant sloop. And get lighter and bluer as you paint the island way off to the right. The keeper's home and lighthouse both have a red roof. Mix up some cadmium red deep and lay in the roof using a quarter inch flat brush. I start with the chimney and intentionally put a sag in the top line of the roof. Don't overdo it, otherwise it'll look cartoonish. Mix a little Payne's gray, cobalt blue and ivory black for the windows, eaves, and doors on the buildings. Keep these elements close to the roof, otherwise they'll stick out like sore thumbs. The top of the lighthouse is painted black. I want to make it appear like it's in sunlight, so I added a little cadmium scarlet to the ivory black and it warms the color slightly. If it was a cool overcast day or if I was painting the shadow, I would have added blue to the black. Mix a huge quantity of cobalt blue and ivory black for the ocean. I always mix more paint than I think I need doubling or even quadrupling the amount. There's nothing worse than running out of paint right in the middle of a big wash. I'm deliberate about where I start. I don't want to jump all around this large area as I mass in the ocean. I have a plan. I work from the horizon, then down to the bottom of the paper, and over to the left. After that, 
I'll paint in the area between the schooner and the lighthouse. Notice how often I reload my brush with more paint. That's key for painting an even tone wash. I leave a little area under the boat to suggest the schooner's reflection and its wake in the water. I paint the lighthouse, the distant sloop, and the schooner by painting the space around them. That's negative painting, just like we did the white clouds. I'm careful not to let the blue overlap the brown of the rock formation. If you do, you'll get a line between the two of them. Carefully paint in the space between the sails, making as interesting a shape as you can. Make sure you don't miss any spots in the ocean. To the leftover evergreen color, add some more French ultramarine blue for the shadow. The light is coming in from the left and above, so we create an interesting shadow shape for the bottom and right side of the trees. Again, I prefer to scrape the brush on its side for a natural looking texture. Take a number six round brush loaded with clear water and put a few soft edges on those shadow shapes. Do the same with the grass area. The ocean needs some texture too. We'll paint in large grouping of lines in the water for the chop. Unfortunately, I didn't realize that the paper was still wet. In order to paint the chop, the paper should have been completely dry. I use a three quarter inch flat and organize the lines in the water in a way that it leads the viewer's eyes back into the composition. But again, the paper's too wet in the front, so I shift gears and work into the area back in the distance. Back here, I make the groupings thinner and less in number. I put a little detail into the schooner. After all, it's probably the focal point of the painting. The rock ledge needs a few shadows. So I mix some ivory black and cobalt blue and put a few shadows in here and there. I soften the top edges of the shadow using a number six round and some clean water. I put in the schooner's mast with some leftover light brown. The foreground is definitely dry now, and I reworked the chop with some darker groupings. Finally, I put a dark reflection under the rock ledge where it meets the water. I hope you enjoyed this demo. To find more about me and my art, visit my website at watercolorpop.com. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel to see new videos as they are released. You'll find a link below. If you enjoyed this video and would like to leave me a tip, I'd greatly appreciate that. On the Paint Along with Pop page on my website, Click on the Commerce button that says Tip Joel. No worries if you can't. Keep watercoloring and stay well. Bye-bye.